It's five o'clock and my students are outside the gate. Every five o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, I would um, open my gate up um, for any student to come to my house, um, to come for extra classes, um, for English or for reading. And this was one of those days. I had been a teacher for a while then, a Teach for Malaysia fellow in the semi-rural town of Gemas, Negeri Sembilan. And I had been teaching English to students who came from very underprivileged backgrounds. Many of them came um, from families that um, were very incomplete or, or um, broken. Many of them worked two jobs during school days so that they would come back um, after midnight working to school completely knackered. And I knew as their English teacher, in order for, for them to go to the level of um, their, their peers in the city, we would need to work really, really hard. And so the only way they would catch up was if they came from my house, to my house for extra classes on a Tuesday afternoon at 5 p.m. But on this Tuesday, I was extremely exhausted. I had been teaching for eight hours non-stop and I had a staff meeting in the afternoon. And so, boy, I was so glad that in the afternoon I told my students, teacher's really tired today, so you don't have to come to my extra class. It's break. Class is cancelled. And I was really looking forward to going home, to hit the sack, and to just sleep the day away, completely exhausted. But just as I laid my head to the bed, the doorbell rang. Actually, I was living in a kampong house, so it was more like my gate was being shaken. And two students were outside the gate saying, Sir Abel, they called me Sir, I don't know why. Uh, but Sir Abel, we're here. And I looked out the window and my heart sank. Two of my students didn't get the memo. They had come to their extra English class. They had walked for about five kilometers to my house under the hot Malaysian sun. And there they were outside. This was five years ago when I was part of the pioneering cohort of Teach for Malaysia Fellows. Every morning, this would be my view on a Monday at 4.30 a.m. Every week, I would pack my supplies, fill my car up with food, with clothes for Monday to Friday, where I would stay in Gamas um, as their teacher. I, I come from Banda Otama, so I'm a PJ boy, and I would travel for about three hours every week um, from my house to Gamas, starting at 4.30 in the morning, in order to reach just in time for a Perlin Punan, or the morning assembly. And at the end of this road to Gamas, I would be greeted by about 1,000 students from a diversity of backgrounds, but who shared a similar circumstance. They were living in a slightly more remote place, and many of them came from underprivileged backgrounds. My students were diverse. Some of them had so much potential that the only difference they had between you and, and them, us and them, was that they came from a different place that they were born in a different place with lack. Some students came from very rough and tough backgrounds. They were involved in gangs. Um, I can tell you the names of the gangs in Gemas. 04, 18, 24. These were the gangs that my students were involved in. And on a typical day after school, I would often see gang fights happening. The Chinese versus the Indians. Motorcycle helmets, batons, and sticks everyone bashing each other up outside of school, and it would be a typical sight in Gemas. I also had students who came from really noble families, but um, with a lot of inadequacies. And these were students who worked to make ends meet, to support their families, because they knew that if they didn't, their families would not make ends meet. I had students who worked two jobs until midnight every day, and would come to school completely exhausted, because they had to support their families. And still, I had students who, at 13 years old, were so high on glue, sniffing glue, that often they would just stay at home because they were completely knackered. These were the students that I met every day. These were the students that I loved um, as a Teach for Malaysia fellow. Every day as their teacher, my battle was for their hearts and minds. 
my battle was um, to drag them out of the toilet literally so that they would stop smoking and come for their English class. My battle was to wake up students who had been sleeping for five hours during the school day because they had been so difficult to the other teachers that the teachers preferred for them to sleep so that they would wake up to learn the difference between is and are. My, my battle was for the hearts and minds of my students. Um, I had a student who uh, once produced an essay like this. In fact, I had many students like this, and um, this was written by Harvin, not his real name. Um, and Harvin at this time was 16 years old. He wrote this after learning English for about five months under my tutelage. And this was a lot of hard work. But as you can see, Harvin was nowhere near where he should be. At the time when I was teaching Harvin, uh, my sister was 16 years old as well. And the difference was stark. Every weekend as I returned home to Banda Otama, I would meet Claudia, my sister, and we would talk about things like Harry Potter and speak to each other in perfect English. For Claudia coming to school and going to university, eventually coming to Inti was a given. But for Harvin, the idea of entering university was an idea he laughed about. It was an idea that he could not believe, much less see. Harvin is not alone. We know that there is an unseen, forgotten generation that we can very easily forget. Uh, we know that it's so easy to live in a middle-class bubble. This hall does not represent the rest of Malaysia, if you didn't realize. But just to illustrate what education inequity is, I'm, I'm going to get us to do a little interactive activity. Um, if I could just get maybe the, the row over here, maybe from the first row to uh, the maybe maybe from the first row to the fifth row, if you could all humor me and stand up, rise to your feet. Yep. You would represent, give or take, one fifth of this hall. You would represent the total amount of Malaysians who would not pass the SPM qualifications. You would represent the Malaysians would never be found in a lecture hall like this for their university education because they would never be able to qualify having not had their SPM qualifications. And if I could get the rest of you in this column to join them on their feet, if you could just stand as well, the rest of you in the same column, you would represent, give or take, 44% of this hall. 44% of Malaysians who do not meet the minimum requirements of English as measured by the Performance for International Student Assessment, or PISA for short, a student assessment tested globally for, uh, for reading, math, and science. Thank you. Please take your seats. Education inequity is real. Education inequity happens year after year, generation after generation, so that the people who stood just now would represent a cycle that would continue. The most sobering thing about education inequity is studies tell us their children would have a 60% likelihood of following in their footsteps, of imitating their trajectory in life, in their education and in their financial choices. And so we talk about the poverty cycle and how it's so similar and so related to this cycle of education inequity. At Teach for Malaysia, we believe in being part of the solutions. Uh, we believe that the problems are great, but the solutions are there, and we can be part of the solutions. We know the problems too well. In fact, we know it so well that we are participa participating in the problems today. Uh, we know that over 300,000 highly skilled Malaysians leave the country every year for greener pastures, because the circumstances are so bleak today. And yet, we now stand at the trajectory of an important place in our country's history. We stand at the intersection between some of our greatest problems, education inequity, and some of our greatest solutions, you. Never before has our country's history seen this many number of graduates. We've never had this number of graduates since our parents' time. We represent the solutions that our countries need, and yet we know how bleak it is. We know that Malaysia is a kind of global haven. 
that we stand at number 52 out of 65 countries globally in the PISA 2009 rankings. It means that we're now performing poorer than Thailand or Kazakhstan in science, math, and reading. It's bleak, and that's why we don't represent the rest of Malaysia, friends. When I was a teacher, I, I recognized um, that there was a responsibility that came with teaching in a high-need school, in a school that was very challenging. Um, and as an English teacher, the responsibility was even larger because English is the tool by which you can see the world. And being part of the pioneering cohort of, of Teach for Malaysia Fellows, it meant that I was now participating in a movement of leaders that to date has over 240 fellows and alumni who've dedicated at least two years of their lives teaching in high-need communities like the community I taught in in Gemas so that the students that they taught would raise their bars, would find their potential. It was a lesson that I, I learned never to doubt what a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can do to change the world because it is the only thing that ever has as Margaret Mead writes. As an English teacher, I had students who came from all walks of life, and, and I learned that anything is possible if you've got the right role models around, the right role models who can show a different way. My students needed to see that there is a different way to be a man. You don't have to disrespect women, your mother and sister, in order to be a man. You don't have to bash each other's heads with motorcycle helmets every 10 seconds to be a man. There are many ways in which you can choose um, better paths in life. And my students often felt like they only had one of two choices, to be the biggest and baddest gangster in Gamas, or to leave the village altogether in order to find greener pastures. I needed to show them a middle path, a way for them to contribute to their community, a way for them to realize the potential of their own village. And so I learned um, the lesson of my students' potential and possibilities. I, I saw how um, Iqbal, one of my students, lit up with a look completely in shock when I told him that he had improved by 40% in his English test. I saw my students stumble upon them playing English games and reading the English dictionary, every teacher's dream, where before, months ago, they had not even known words like green or red. I saw um, my students improving in terms of the way they related to each other and starting to look at each other in the eye where before they had no confidence to stand in front of the class. And I saw in my student Erin, her confidence peaking up. In early 2013, I was an English teacher to a, a class called 4J. And uh, my, the classes were named after precious stones, so my class was called 4J. Um, and I, I taught a student called Erin, just not her real name. And Erin was one of those really bright sparks. She was so verbal and outspoken. She was so brave. The only thing she didn't have was the resources to tap into her potential further. Unlike many of us, Erin grew up in a family that could not afford extra tuition or extra textbooks or English tutors. And so she had what she had, which wasn't enough. One day I realized that Erin wasn't coming to school. Um, she had been absent for about five days and as, as a class teacher, it was my responsibility to, to give her a call and to find out why. And so I picked up the phone call and I said, Erin, kenapa tak datang ke sekolah? Sudah banyak hari Erin tak datang. And over the other line, Erin said, Cikgu, saya malu. I found out why she was embarrassed. She was nursing a broken nose. And that broken nose was because her father had abused her and punched her right in the middle of her face. Erin was the product of not just an unjust system, she was the product of a broken family. And it made me realize just the great responsibility I had, it was both a responsibility and a burden. It struck home really hard when I went home over the weekend and met my sister Claudia who shared the same age as Erin at the same time to recognize that there was no difference between Erin and Claudia except that Erin was dealt a bad hand of cards in life and that was the only thing that she was at fault for. 
as a teacher, I knew that I had a great responsibility. And, and one day, when an opportunity came for me to involve my students um, in this uh, competition, I knew who to pick. It was a competition that involved students pitching for a student improvement project for their school. And all they needed to do for this competition was to come together as a group and uh, think about a school improvement idea and pitch it to a board of managers in a corporate partner that Teach for Malaysia was connected with. No big deal, right? Really easy. It was really difficult as an idea for my students because English wasn't just a second language, it was a foreign language. But I knew that Erin was just the right student. And so I brought Erin in, got together some of her friends, and we came together to prepare for this student improvement project. And after school every day, we would spend about 20 minutes just practicing, practicing, practicing. We would refine her student improvement idea. Uh, we would refine the English presentation skills. We would put together a PowerPoint deck. All really simple things for university graduate trained people, right? But for Erin and her and friends, this was extremely unnerving because not only were they going to be presenting in PowerPoint, they were going to be presenting in English, a completely foreign language to them. To no less, a board of managers in a corporate partner. The day came when the competition arrived and Erin and her friends, having practiced for days and days, they stood before the, before the co uh, corporate board of managers and they presented with so much gusto and so much courage that the board of managers were completely blown away. Erin and her friends were doing something that many people did not expect they would do, that Kampong Peak kids would be able to be doing. And you know what? At the end of the competition, Erin and her friends emerged champions. The school was completely blown away. No one expected Erin and her friends to emerge champions, much less speak in English to bosses from a corporate company. But Erin and her friends did it, and they emerged champions winning a funding in order to run this student improvement project. They did it because they had the potential to begin with, but they also did it because my colleagues and I stood with them to give them the little that we have. And I take a step back after an incident like this, asking myself, actually, what did I do? It wasn't much. It was merely just 20 minutes on a few days after school, um, teaching Erin and her friends things that I already knew. Things that we often take for granted, right? PowerPoint and English. And I take a diff another step back and I think, what if 50 people did the same? What if 50 people decided to give a little bit of their time and their effort and their experience in order to bless someone else? Or what if 200 people decided to do this? Imagine the possibilities that would come if we were to be part of the solutions. Because, as in the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of committed, committed thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I end my presentation with uh, the story of the five o'clock class. I'm completely exhausted, right? I look out of the window, and there are my two students who didn't get the memo that class was cancelled. And they're outside shaking my gate saying, Sir April, we're here for class. And I groan inside because I'm completely exhausted. And I'm ashamed to admit this because this is every teacher's dream. Your students are coming to your house to learn extra English. This is what they need. But I'm completely exhausted after teaching for an entire day. But because my students have walked for five kilometers under the sun, I open the gate to them and they come into my living room where we have a little library. And I bring out the Peter and Jane books for them to start reading. And I tell them, teacher's really exhausted today, so why don't you read to each other? Be independent learners, right? Um, just correct each other and read and um, you, you'll get better. And I'm going back to my room to take a short afternoon nap. Is that okay? And cheerfully they say yes. And I go back to my room, I shut the door behind me and I start laying on my bed, ready to take my afternoon nap. But just as I lay my head to the pillow, I begin to hear the voices of my students outside in the living room. And there they are, reading enthusiastically. 
their voices rising above the afternoon heat, correcting each other. Peter has a dog. Jane has a dog. And as they read, correcting each other enthusiastically, I start to weep. I, I weep on the bed because I'm completely exhausted. But I also weep because there are my students outside, reading and trying so hard. And there I am, trying to rest off in the afternoon. And it's so hard. But I also, read, I also weep because they're just reading wrongly. <laughs> and someone needs to go out there and help them. And so I wipe my tears, I get off from my bed, I go out of the door, and I join them reading their Peter and Jane. And in many ways, I take a step back and I think, it's just like all of us. And I wonder, what are we sleeping on today? What is preventing us from getting out of the door to read with the two students outside in our living room? Because we should never doubt that a small group of committed, thoughtful citizens can change the world. Thank you.